Welcome to the PyBytes command line tricks training, become a more productive developer. I'm Bob Belderbos, and in this training, I want you to become more productive as a developer. And one of the things is the command line. The more effective you are at the command line, the more effective you are as a developer. So in this training, I will show you a couple of my favorite tricks I use every day. First of all, shell aliases. Like if I want to show the files in the directory, ordered by oldest to newest and in human readable format, I can just type LT because that's an alias. So here in my downloads folder, if I do an LT, I get my files ordered ascending from oldest to newest and the sizes are more readable as opposed to the normal LS minus L where this doesn't make sense. Here I quickly see this is 2.7 gigas. I got aliases to CD into my downloads folder. I got quick aliases to tweak my bash RC, which by the way, upgrading my iMac, I'm now on the Z shell, but it's the same principle. I want to quickly be able to access that file so I can add more tweaks as I go. Same for the VimRC. And there's more things I use every day. And the more I use it, the more likely I want it to be automated away with an alias. For example, git status, instead of typing 10 characters every time, I can just type GS, two characters. So if we're going into one of my projects, GS is much faster than typing git status the whole time. Also to make a virtual environment, assuming that I don't have one, I can call pvamp which is an alias for Python 3.9 minus M, fem, fem, and then M% percent activate the virtual environment. By the way, uh, M% percent means if the previous command succeeded, only then do the second command. That's oftentimes better than doing semicolon because if the first command fails, sometimes you definitely don't want to <laughs> do the second command. So I'm recommending using M%. Percents. So more aliases, I can play an alarm sound. That's another project we have on our open source repo. I can look up Valenciano, uh, the local dialect here, words easily. So if I do Mariposa, that's in Valenciano is um, Papayona, but actually I usually, when I'm doing homework with my son, have to go the other way around. So I read a word in Valenciano that doesn't make sense then I can translate it into Spanish. And under the hood, that's doing a curl to the Valenciano dictionary, doing a grab head and then strip out some tags using a regular expression using Perl. And this piping we will look at in a next trick. I tweaked my path to include my bin directory where I have my own scripts. Lately, by the way, I made the bin directory a soft link to the bin directory in my Dropbox. And then when I change system, which I had to do recently, I can just make this link again, uh, which by the way, you can do with ln minus s. And yeah, this way I have my script stored in the cloud and I never lose anything. And then I have, well, before when I used bash, I used git prompt.sh and that shows the branch, as you can see here in the prompt. And the Z shell, that's a little bit different. I can show it. If you adopt this snippet from the link that's shown here, you can get the uh, current branch you're on with Git in your command line prompt. And there are some other stuff going on. For example, when the last command succeeded, uh, I get a green check mark. And if not, I get an indication that the last command was not exited successfully. Um, but that's beside the point. This is the setup to get your Git branch in the prompt, which is very useful. Otherwise, you have to constantly check with Git status on which branch you are. So that concludes aliases. Very useful. And that's something you build up over the years, the more you use your shell. Common shortcuts. CD to go to home. CD dash to go back to the previous directory. I use that all the time to toggle between two directories make directory and then immediately I can reference that directory with dollar underscore 
if I can do this right. And of course here you see the ampersand doing its job. I didn't do the CD because the make there failed because that director was already there. So let's do that again. I made the directory and I cd it into the directory in one command. Again, doing the CD only if the previous command succeeded and I can reference some there with this magic variable. I can loop with four. So here we make four integers and we can just echo them out or do anything. We can even make the files with touch and now we have those files available. So very powerful to quickly do looping. Obviously you can all do all of this with Python, but sometimes nothing beats doing something fast in the shell. And we can use a set um, to do replacements in files. And I like this Vim shortcut to do it in a Vim file. So if you have some content, We can do a global substitution, hello by something else like this. So that's very powerful in Vim to do a global replacement of one pattern by the other. So I should actually say percentage to indicate that I want to do it not on a single line, but on the whole file. Fast wrapping and file finding. So two of my favorite tools are AG, AKA the silver searcher, which allows me to, in any project, search for a certain string. And I made an alias to look for Python only files, because sometimes we have a lot of uh, static assets like JavaScript, HTML, and sometimes I want to limit my search to Python only. So here's a good example, actually. The imports are also matching in the readme.rsd. If I do agg import, then um, the matches are only in the Python source code, which can be very handy. So you can brew installed on a Mac, um, but get the ag tool. It's super useful. Uh, funny enough, before I would do something like this, I would list all the files, <laughs> which is already a disaster. And then sarks, grab import, now you will see sarks in a bit, and of course I get all that <laughs> noise with tux, it's, it's a disaster. But with AG, you can just do this straight away and it's much faster as well. And for file searching, I use FZF, and I have a shortcut in my Vim that if I do comma T or leader T, I can just type ahead and open any file very quickly. So that's super useful. So look up FCF and get that tool and uh, you have a very quick way uh, to find your files in a project. If you're not using an IDE, of course. Understanding standard out and error, that's quite fundamental. To demo standard output and standard error, we can um, look at a file that exists or directory so that's a successful output. And if we do an LS on VAMP2, we get an error because it doesn't exist. So we can distinguish these output streams by one file handler one and two. So we can send them to different outputs. So if I do, if I send the standard output to out and the standard error to error, we can inspect the different streams. And here, this was a successful command, so the output got saved in out. And error, there was nothing, right? So let's undo that and do it for that under command that's meant to fill. So we do ls on a non-existing directory. And now we can see that the standard output didn't send anything, but the standard error sent that vamp to no such file or directory. So that's a way to separate um, standard output and error. And to get both file descriptors, you can use two greater than ampersand one. Um, very importantly, I in my bashrc or what's currently the cshrc file, I have this set minus o no clobber. 
and that prevents me from accidentally overwriting files. So for example, if I want to send something to tox.ini, it says file exists. And that's because I set um, no clubber. So that's a protection mechanism. However, you can overwrite this, which sometimes is useful with the requirements by using a greater than uh, pipe. Here again is that overriding mechanism that sometimes is useful when you when you pip upgrade some dependencies and you want to store them again in the requirements. Of course, you can also delete the file and then recreate it without doing this hack. All right, pipelines, my favorite, and what really shows the Unix philosophy of every utility doing one thing and doing it very well. So let's download some Harry Potter text, which I already have here from one of the bytes. Let's go to downloads, deactivate, clear screen, or control L, curl minus O, Harry. So now we have this Harry text, right? We can see what it has in terms of lines, words, and characters with the WC commands. Again, underlining the Unix philosophy of one command doing one thing very well. And we can start to pipe those things together. So for example, we can cat the file, but now it's just a, a long string, multi-line string. So what if I want to break it down into every word on a single line so I can do some statistics? I can use TR to replace a space with a new line. Now each word is on a new line. And of course, we usually would do some cleanup now with some regex, whatever. But I'm just keeping it simple. Now I'm going to sort the words. Then I'm going to count them with Unix minus C. And now I'm going to sort them again, but numerically in descending order. And then I'm taking the head, and I can see that the A and two he are the top hitters. If I want some more, I can give it minus 20. Got Dursley there, so that makes a lot of sense. So yes, I'm all in favor of always writing Python code, but look at how fast we could do this piping different Unix subcommands together, which are each one of them very specialized in what they do. So this is really beautiful. And for me, this really illustrates the power of Unix in the command line. Form and background processes. So this is pretty easy. And I use this all the time with Vim. So for example, going back to the PyBytes Faker uh, project, I might be working in, in a file, say provider, I'm doing some coding here. And I want to go to my shell again to run the test, or maybe I want to interact with Git. So I can press Control Z. And now I'm back at my shell, I can do git whatever and so i can clean up because this was just some experimentation or i can enable my virtual environment well, in this case i use poetry so i can run the test which is slow because it needs to cache the data first second time it should be faster yeah, perfect. And then I can use FG to go back to my Vim session, right? What if I have several sessions? So here I'm working on the test, right? So now if I do jobs, uh, I got two Vims open, right? And I can go back and forth with them. Well, in bash, that's foreground one or whatever the number is. In Z shell, that's actually one and percentage two, right? Percentage one or two. So it's kind of similar. So I'm toggling a lot between my editor, Vim, and the terminal, uh, where I can do Git and command line stuff and have this all in one terminal. I don't have to open multiple tabs per se. I can just, thanks to the foreground and background, I'm, I can have multiple sessions open here at once. Very useful, and that's one of the main things of my development process. Um, reason I don't use an IDE per se. Repeating stuff. Um, we can run, we can look at the history. We can run a command again with um, exclamation mark and the number. So it brings back the command and then I can execute it. 
I can repeat the last command with double exclamation mark. And very powerful is Control R, which lets you search with a type ahead. So here are some things I recently installed with Brew. And I think I expanded the history to a lot of hits. So it's keeping a lot of records for me. So this is very powerful. Valenciano can get that back. Yeah. All the last stuff we did, etc. So if you're not using control plus R, you're missing out. It makes it very fast for you to go back to any command. Getting help, uh, well for Unix, man, there's a lot of stuff in there. Usually at the end they give some examples, which might be useful. You can read up on man with man man. <laughs> Uh, you can use PyDoc to look at um, Python documentation from the command line, which might be faster than going into the browser. And again, you don't have to leave your terminal. I wrote a little package called PySource. So let's just pull that into here quickly. pip install pybytes PySource, I believe. And that lets me look at any source code, for example, func tools, partial, and then I can just dump into my browser, I can page it, or I can dump it into Vi with view minus, or just Vi in editor mode, minus, and the minus here reads from standard inputs. So this command sends output to standard output, but after the pipe, it's reading in from standard. That standard output becomes standard input. So if you say vi minus, it's saying read from standard input. So basically, pipe this output into Vim, which is very useful because once in Vim, I can, I can search for stuff and do all the Vim goodness, and I can just close it out. But then I discovered Py, B Python. And actually, um, this is a very powerful shell. So I can do, actually it recorded what I did previously. And I can do partial and then F2 to read in the source code as well. And then it is color coded. So yeah, my tool is kind of nice, but this is uh, richer and uh, easier to get to. And you can do the same with IPython, if you can find it. If I go to my notebooks, here we have a virtual environment that should have IPython. Can do the same thing. And here with the double question mark, I can read the source as well. And with a single one, I can look at the documentation or the doc string. So yeah, those are awesome tools you want to have in your tool belt. Then dates, uh, funny trick with Unix, you can look at any month and year uh, with the cal command. And I made a little alias because I often need to know what week it is, which I inevitably go to in my browser. And I can just type what week. And now we're at week 21, which is just using Python one liner with the minus C flag. So that can be pretty useful. And again, then we leverage the alias to get that into my environment. So pretty good stuff. Resources, we have a developer tools article. We have a Vimtrix article, because if you want, if you go full command line, then you probably want to learn Vim as well, because that's really a match in heaven. And we have a full dev tools training that discusses more tools that will make you a more productive developer. And talking about becoming a better developer, we're big on coaching, we help people build practical real world applications. And after 10 weeks working together, they come out as confident and very skilled developers. So if you're interested in that, you want to boost your career, take your Python to the next level, including all these tools like command line Git, deployment, testing, then come talk to us, uh, hop on a strategy call with us and we look into your particular situation and how we can best help you. Really passionate about this stuff. People we work with get great results. We have a lot of fun and uh, yeah, it uh, has come a long way. So I would be happy to meet you, book a call, and we can talk a bit more. Thanks for watching this training. Hope it was helpful. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next training.